Machinists are the most important of all tradesmen. Without machinists, no other trade would have the tools to do their jobs. Everything you see on a day-to-day -day basis owes its existence in some way to a machinist and machining, from plastics to clothing to metals to a paper cup. But where did machining come from? My name is Barry Setzer, and I come from a long line of machinists going back at least four generations. Our family originated in Germany, and our last name comes from the German word for typesetter or die setter. So you could say that my last name actually means machinist. My father is a master die maker, and I used to spend a lot of time in his machine shop. One day I was looking at his Bridgeport mill, and I asked him how his machines were built if no machines existed to build them. And he told me that machines started off very simple and sloppy, and every subsequent iteration of a machine became better and more accurate and more rigid and more versatile until you get the machine that's in front of you today. That made sense, but where did it all start, and how did we get to this world filled with insane multi-axis machines with axes synced together perfectly, capable of holding tolerances of millionths of an inch? The lathe is an ancient tool, and is known as the mother of machine tools. The earliest evidence of turning on a lathe dates back to ancient Egypt and Mycenaean Greece around 1300 BC. Stone carvings clearly show one man rotating a piece of wood using a rope and the other using a sharp object to cut the wood. Yes, lathoglyphics! The lathe remained a pretty simple device for a couple thousand years and was used to make bowls, candlesticks, furniture, sharpened swords, and tons more. Then, hundreds of years later, Leonardo da Vinci invented the first lathe with a slide rest, and in 1718, a Russian engineer also invented a similar lathe, and this was the first major improvement to this ancient technology. A few decades went by, and in 1772, the UK developed a horse-powered lathe used to make stronger, more accurate cannons. These saw a lot of action during the American Revolutionary War and kind of explains why we measure our spindle power and horsepower to this day. Around this time, people started to use lathes for a process called rotary filing, where you would hold a file in your hand, spin your part in a lathe, and mill material away. The origin of milling machines isn't precisely known, but this is certainly where the process began, and small shops implemented new ideas to push this technology forward. In 1783, the famous London clockmaker Samuel Rahe invented a milling machine, and in 1795, Eli Terry of Connecticut began using a mill to produce wooden clocks. This introduced interchangeable precision parts to the clock industry, which completely changed the way clocks were produced. Between 1814 and 1818, the earliest development of true milling machines took place at the Springfield and Harper's Ferry Federal Armories. During this time, Eli Whitney, who also invented the cotton gin, produced the first true mill, which is the oldest one still in existence. Then in 1860, Brown and Sharp developed a universal milling machine that solved the issue of three-axis travel, allowing for the milling of spirals like you see in the flutes of a twist drill. During this time, lathes continued to see technological advances as people started to use steam power and insane pulley systems to drive their spindles. If you just Google belt-driven machine shop, you can find some crazy pictures of how these shops function. It doesn't look too safe. By 1936, Rudolf Banel made some major improvements to the mill and called it the Bridgeport. It was small, light, affordable, but also versatile, well-built, and rigid. Over a quarter million of these were built, and almost every machinist has seen one. This was the mill that brought milling to hobbyists, garage shops, and the world of machining. Then in 1952, numerical control began to develop in the lab and was used pretty much only in a couple aerospace shops. As machinists became aware of this technology, many of them rolled their eyes and said things like, NC machines are never going to replace manual machinists. But during the 60s and 70s, NC evolved into CNC as data storage and computing evolved. As these machines were implemented, the face of manufacturing changed forever, and this technology continues to develop to this day. While there are still manual machinists out there, CNC absolutely took over manufacturing. Now we have these crazy nine axis lathes with live tooling and mill spindles, dual turret, dual spindle lathes with live tooling, five axis mills that can spin their tables like a lathe, EDMs that vaporize metal with electricity, metal printers, Swiss machines, and thousands of other machines that are just mind blowing. So, what's next? Well, we're already starting to see some of it. Artificial intelligence that's capable of learning from everyone on earth and can write its own G-code, augmented reality that can do things like count thousands of parts at a glance, 
virtual reality worlds where you can slap on a headset and learn how to run a CNC machine in a completely virtual world, nano robots that can build a part one atom at a time, the possibilities are endless. The only question is, will you be one of the naysayers that thinks these technologies won't change the world while you're using your tried and true high speed steel end mill on your trusty bridge port? Or will you be one of the pioneers that embraces the change and helps to develop the future of machining? Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out CNC Expert, our free online academy, and our online store. The platforms we created to help change your shop from the shop of yesterday to the shop of tomorrow.